for these products, like the new knowledge about how the product works is always generated by the developer working on, on the product. And they really understand it deeply. So that's where the, the real new knowledge actually is generated. Hi, everyone. You're listening to Scaling DevTools, the show that investigates how DevTools go from zero to one. I'm joined today by Nico, who is the co-founder and CEO of Rerun. Nico, thanks so much for joining. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, because uh, I know you're working on some really, really amazing stuff with uh, computer vision um, or helping companies that are building with computer vision. Could you tell us a bit about what you're working on? Sure. Um, yeah, so we're building Rerun. It's the easiest way to, like the most concrete way to, to think about it. Basically, it's it's uh, two things. So it's a SDK for logging like computer vision and robotics data. And then there's a visualization app for basically auto- taking that data that you log and automatically building like really useful, um, fast, beautiful um, visualizations that, may, that help you understand what you're building. The so one metaphor that's that can be really useful is to think of it as visual printf uh, style kind of debugging, but for computer vision data. Yeah, that's amazing. And could you tell us the story of like how you came to build Rerun? Yeah, sure. So actually, my two co-founders and I uh, were previously working. So this was, a, a, I think, almost 10 years ago now. No, not quite. But a while ago, we were working at a 3D... 3D scanning company uh, that like does 3D scanning of feet in like physical retail uh, to recommend shoes. Um, so that's actually a surprisingly difficult problem to do really well. It's like quite quite a quite complex. A lot of things go wrong, and yeah, physical retail is, is a tough environment to to ship like working computer vision products in. Um, so at that company, we built like really good internal visualization tools, and uh, I guess basically what happened. So Emil, our, our CTO now. He came in from the gaming world and kind of approached things differently and built this like, I see he started to approach problems by building this like really rich, like visualization, like data visualization environments almost. And then somehow like it became very easy to see what was wrong and what you needed to build uh, from, from that, uh, that point. And that kind of transformed how we worked uh, at that company. I think so, so he kind of took those way, that way of working and built like some uh, really great internal tools start out as debug uh, tools for, for just for us algorithm developers. So that's what I was then, uh, computer vision and machine learning engineer uh, on that team. And uh, yeah, it was super useful for us, but quickly became also then the tool that we used to kind of, yeah, debug live devices, debug pr- sort of products out uh, like in production. It became used by yeah, more and more parts of the organization. So like data labelers, uh, like operations and support, it even got used in like, sales calls uh, and, and stuff like that. So it just permeated the organization was a really key part of success for that company. It became what very clearly won that market, I'd say, like, and got out with a good working product like years before anyone else. And then I left and I, I spent spent time building mainly like mobile computer vision products of different kinds. Um, and I needed the same thing again. It's like I had seen the light, like this is how you do things and oh, there's nothing out there. And I kept like every new project, I kept asking like, okay, now someone has to have built it because it's obvious that you need it. Um, but they hadn't. Uh, so previous to this, I, I uh, started another company, that, like an AR, um, mobile AR company, not to get into that, but the lack of good tools was like a really big problem. So that's, that's, um, that's kind of like how we, fell into this, like fi- decided that, okay, I'm not, I'm not starting another, I'm not doing any more computer vision until this like tooling part is fixed because everything else has kind of become easy enough. Like it's relatively easy to train a neural net now and deploy it and all that kind of stuff that had been hard, but this like, just the problem of like understanding what your, your systems are doing, um, live kind of over time in like 3d and, and that kind of stuff like maybe on a device, but also getting the exact same visualization on your like development machine and the same thing on your, like if you're digging into what happened on a, like a big evaluation job. So that whole system was kind of really, really missing. And we decided to go, um, solve it together for, for hopefully to help, uh, kind of the whole computer vision and machine learning industry just, um, or not the industry, I guess, but the, everybody doing that kind of stuff, like really make 
good product for the that make the world better. Yeah. So that's that's kind of why, how we get into it. Yeah, and when you kind of stitch it all together and look back, like it sounds like it was just this huge problem that you just kept facing again and again and again. Yeah. Um, was it like something that was really obvious that you had to go start a company to solve it? Or was it, did it kind of come from looking and like introspecting and like, was it, yeah, the process? I guess I, I can keep going back to knowing that someone needed to solve solve it. It had to be solved. It had to be a project. I guess we knew that or thought of that for a very long time. Um, it was obvious that like actually solving it right is a huge undertaking. So I think that was what sort of held me back earlier. And it kept being like, ah, is this market big enough? Or like, uh, is it too early and so on? And then, yeah, I think this, we started it a little bit more than a year ago and we spent a lot of time just trying to figure out like, is, is this now the right time? And just talking to a lot of, a lot of potential users and kind of just looking at a lot of uh, potential companies found that, that uh, sort of all the other aspects are have kind of made it made it ripe that now now people are actually building real products based on uh computer vision and sort of similar tech and truly deploying it and like making real things and that's sort of starting to happen now at like a large scale so it's i think yeah so more of a timing question all the time mm. yeah. yeah yeah that makes sense and so when you when you decided to kind of work on it and like now you're building something could you talk about like how you thought about um, what you should build in terms of like, I know you've done a lot of thinking about like open source versus not open source. And yeah. So uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So we, I guess, had inklings that it should be open source and that it was, it's really important for this kind of thing that it's something that is adopted by the developer. Uh, one, I mean, there are many aspects to this, but like, the first thing that we kind of knew from experience is that for these products, like the new knowledge about how the product works is always generated by the developer working on, on the product. They're trying to solve something for themselves, like understand how some aspect of an algorithm is performing in, in some situation or building something new and so on. And, and when they do that, they make, if they can, they make really useful like explanations because they're trying to solve a real problem and um, they really understand it deeply. So that's where the, the real new knowledge actually is generated and kind of encoded into visualizations. So it's in tools becoming a lot less useful when they're kind of made after the fact by a tools team. Uh, so that, that was like one, one thing that came from a lot of experience, just seeing that over and over again, that it's really important to have the developer be the one do, building a lot of the visualizations at least, or the researcher. So that, that was one aspect. Uh, another one was, um, yeah, really us, us finding that, uh, computer vision is so u broadly useful. It just can, has the potential to have huge, huge impacts in just so many different markets. So, you know, like construction, security, agriculture, just all forms of autonomy augmented reality, just really, really widely. And we spent a lot of time talking to a lot of these kinds of developers in the beginning. And I really found like it was, we had their own experience just from our friends and so on, but just really seeing that people also change jobs e like easily between those industries. So lots of people change like, oh, I'm, I work in medical AI and yeah, next year they're an AR or, or a self-driving or something like that. Um, so this is really the same developer across all these industries. So you have this like market dynamic where there's one layer that's horizontal, which is this developer. And then you have lots of like application areas that are very different. And if you were to try and sell kind of directly into each vertical, that would be impossible really to do like top down like here. Like you just come with a, you know, have a application focused website and you come in with your salespeople and so on. You can just target, then you have to target just the top few. Um, but if you go bottoms up, so you can have the developers are adopting it, you can actually target, yeah, the, all of, all of them. So that, that I guess is another aspect that, that pushed us to like, this needs to be a developer focused kind of bottoms up adoption kind of product. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. So those developers are the ones that are just like totally, uh, you know, 
it, they don't really need a like super super tailored product as long as they can like tweak it and stuff and they don't need to tailor or they or maybe put another way they don't need tailored like landing pages and sales people who have got loads of examples of like you know here are the here's here's the success that we brought at this other industry yeah, yeah. exactly they don't need they're not exactly excited by the white paper saying like here are five reasons and this is how you increase efficiency by 50% or whatever. It's, they can see the capability, they know what capabilities they want. And if they, or if they haven't thought of it and they just see like a video or an example, they go, oh yeah, that's, I, I need that. And this, you can kind of be much more capabilities focused, which is a lot broader in our, in our case, at least that's, that really addresses a lot more people. Um, yeah, so that, that has huge implications to how you, I guess, can go to market with a, a product like this. Yeah. So it's just been all about like getting that kind of, as you said, bottoms up developer kind of love that they really, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, that's, I guess, our, the first big, big part in our, our go to market, you could say, I mean, how we go about that. We've worked really closely actually with several like teams. So, I mean, our initial approach was really that we built so we, we wanted this to be open source, but, and we had like, had all the, the whole, everything was open source license. I maybe I can just say something quickly about that. So the, the base setup is that we're open core company. So the base, base rerun is completely free and open source. It's licensed under MIT and uh, Apache two. Um, and it's just. Uh, on its own, it should be like an incredible product, but it's targeted at like a single developer and be working locally on their own machine with like, or locally with one robot or one device, or that's the, the use case that we're really, really optimizing for. And then the commercial product will build on top of that, like targeting needs of teams uh, working together uh, with like products in production. So <clears throat> initially though, we didn't, start out targeting like single developers is actually harder. Um, if you're targeting a single developer, you have really high requirements on like super low friction. It just needs to be more built out and you need to never get stumped. Like the first, like if you hit the friction point where I, the thing I want to do wasn't possible, you'll directly jump to, I guess you'd say like a less powerful, um, tool that at least you can kind of hack around. And if you're addressing a team, they are not necessarily like that. Then you can build a subset of features that like solves their biggest needs for the team. So that's what we started with. Actually, we started working with a few teams then and made sure that we had like more or less, I guess the team year version of the product working, working for them really well. And then sort of started breaking out to make it more and more sort of focused on, on single developers. And we're still really in that process of just improving, continually improving the experience for single developers, like pr sort of in that prototyping stage in particular. Yeah. So the, the singular use is completely open source. And then the teams, you, you started out with the teams, but in the long run, that part would probably yeah. not be. Well, all the things we built will be are free and open source. The, the teams focus things that we will charge for. Uh, or more rather like direct, like live, like collaboration, syncing data. There's a lot of issues around performance that makes collaboration really difficult. Um, this is just, these data sets get quite uh, big because so basically what we're doing since we're not just helping you visualize maybe your data set, it's really the internal state of your, of your algorithms over time. So you're kind of like exploding up the data a lot. You can imagine like maybe if you're doing uh, optimization or trying to optimize uh, the position of a camera relative to an image or something like that. Um, then you actually want to be able to look at the rich view of all that data for each optimization step, maybe. So that's an example that, well, that, that visualization requires maybe a hundred times more data than just the input and output. Yeah. Uh, potentially. Yeah. So it gets a lot and it's really important to be able to look that deeply. So just being able to kind of collaborate around that you need good infrastructure for, um, yeah, for sharing, um, and just perform handling performance is, is really critical. So those, those are some of the like more team aspects. So those things we didn't build for, for anyone at that time, but you can still use our product as a team, right? 
but just you don't get all those those great features um until we kind of the sort of release the commercial product yeah yeah okay that's really cool so there's like a very clear way where you've got there's very clear problems that fit um into the kind of like yeah yeah i think so and it's also quite sim- simple in another way it's just like if you need if some problem needs a service running then that's first that's commercial mm. yeah yeah that makes sense because it's going to cost you and then yeah pretty straightforward like we need to run it yeah. uh, it's also easy to understand yeah. for users like yeah they're managing the service like of course i'm gonna pay for that yeah i feel like that's actually like a really really important part of like the pricing it seems like developers are yeah. like what this doesn't cost you anything why am i paying for this yeah and if it like if it does then they're a lot more like amenable to <laughs> paying yeah yeah exactly and i guess we as being developers ourselves have experienced that it's not exactly rash well, maybe it's rational but I don't know. It's not maybe the most sympathetic, but we're like that ourselves. So we're not better ourselves. So we definitely empathize with that uh, feeling with other developers. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like, I, I totally, yeah. I, I think there's times I've been very frustrated with software where I'm like, what? It's literally like one tiny little thing I want to change. And now you're forcing me to upgrade. And it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really, it's a really nice way to do it. I know that since you kind of released that things have become like you, you've been getting a lot of, a lot of love online and a lot of uh, mm-hmm. kind of GitHub stars and activity. Um, could you talk a bit about how you've generated that? Sure. Um, well, I, I mean, first of all, I think the most important thing is that I hope at least that, that we're building something that will be like really genuinely useful and that a lot of people are, that have been in this space have been waiting for something like this for a long time and maybe built things themselves. Maybe they built something great and then kind of bit decay sort of uh, took its hold and that project is now dead or they changed companies and they can't use it. So they just like, I think a lot of people who are in this space, like have been wanting this for a while. And so I think that's, I mean, obviously the, co- the core thing, but then obviously we did some more tactical kind of things. So our product is very visual. Um, so we did spend like, even when, when everything was closed, we spent some time just trying to practice, I guess, uh, visually telling, explaining what, what rerun is, uh, by ma- like making different kind of like videos of examples we were building and, and trying to like figure out kind of how that worked, what people, re- what resonated with people. Like this basically, I mean, none of us were good visual storytellers before, I guess. I don't know that we are now, but I think we're a little better. Um, and just going through a lot of, just posting a lot of videos and, and so on and kind of learning, yeah, just how to explain it and what, what kind of got people excited. I think that we did that continually um, for the first four or five months before the release. And I think that had a really big effect. Then we took all of those learnings. So we, we open sourced, or it was always open source, I guess, but we made it public. Uh, in mid February, so it's that it's like almost yeah, a couple of months ago. Yeah, um, and uh, for that launch, I guess we took all those learnings, and then I basically went like we created all the the base material, and I went and sat with a real kind of editor, and we tried to put together like a really tight, less than one minute video, like really showcasing and explaining how everything works, and we spent a lot of effort to make that easy to understand, but also kind of engaging and, and so on. And I think that had a huge effect. So, so that video made our kind of launch, I guess, go quite far. Um, so that was like one of the, the things that we did. Um, and just also tried to kind of build in the open as, as people do. Um, we had some, some uh, success early on, kind of just writing to lots of computer vision developers, like directly DMing them on LinkedIn. Um, so that is, I guess, one of those like surprising things, but I guess we try to do it in a non salesy creepy way, just sort of, Hey, we're working on this, love your feedback or some variation of that. Or like, I think what you're, you're doing is cool, but I don't know. It, it, it's even hard to say without making it sound like a creepy LinkedIn thing, but we, we tried at least and to be relatively genuine and so on. And, and I think we, that was a good way to get in early conversations with a lot of like a potential users. 
um yeah no relatively okay it's not scalable but it's the easiest it's fairly easy at least uh and it was useful and i think that that was also good too like we got yeah i guess in front of a lot of people people like that as well yeah yeah sort of early on yeah it's really smart and I, I know you kind of um you said that like a lot of the people that are on linkedin and, and do use it may not actually be you know on twitter um yeah yeah i think i guess the tech community is like very twitter focused um i mean i i also follow things on twitter and so on i'm not uh i'm not great at it myself but um there are a lot of great people in tech or that are not on twitter really and don't they maybe fall like just they have an account but it's not important to them so in particular i think in these like a little bit more hard sciencey fields so like com- robotics and computer vision kind of they're more i i've found that many of them are more likely to be on on LinkedIn and they find lots of good papers and like interesting methods. Like there are a hundred influencers sharing stuff like that, that are, I mean, they're really doing u- useful job sharing uh, interesting work. So they're on there and yeah, it's a little bit overlooked by a lot of the tech community because it's, I guess, not as cool kind of, so yeah. Cool arbitrage. Yeah. That's really cool. I guess it's like kind of, there's a, the platform is not inherently bad. Like people, there's, yeah. if there's good people on there and you're, you know, and they, they do go there for, for some reason, um, then yeah, it's absolutely easy. Exactly. And I guess the the third thing was, I mean, we are a rust shop, so we, all of rerun is built like really from the ground up, uh, in rust. So that's like, we use Apache arrow, uh, but other than that, like our whole database is custom, like from the ground up, like, um, the render is written on top of WGPU, but yeah, and that is a completely custom. We use the Rust GUI framework, eGUI. So it's like really end-to-end Rust. And that's important for us for lots of reasons. But um, Rust is also a good, it's just a really popular area. Rust developers love Rust, and love talking to Rust with other people. So that has been a important driver for us to just get out in front of lots of, lots of people. It's just like sort of talking about that we're doing it in Rust and why and and so on. That's that's been kind of a, a big driver for for getting exposure for the project for us as well and interest and so on. Yeah, yeah, and it's also helps with your hiring, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I just have this this continually every time we've been out hiring. I just um, I'm amazed by the incredible talent that is ready to switch jobs for just just for the sake of working in Rust on their day job. Uh, just so many great engineers and I, it's kind of, in one way it gets, makes me sad that like, I can't hire all these like great people. So maybe, I mean, we're a small company, we don't, can't do the old school Google thing of just hiring everybody that's good. We need to kind of match it to the particular role and all, all that stuff. But yeah, every, all, all teams out there that are, that could be using, <laughs> using Rust and are having trouble hiring. I mean, they're really missing out, I'd say. So that, that's been super useful for us. Yeah. So, so building Rust. I I think you should build in Rust. Yeah, if if at all practical, it's a very strong, uh, it's a strong choice. Put it that way. Very very cool. Yeah, and Nico, um, I think that's all we've got time for. But I wondered what would be like your key takeaways for any founders of DevTools or uh, people working in DevTools listening. So I'd say the main thing I guess that that's worked for us consistently and that continues to seem to to work well is that. Yeah, we're we're building um we're solving our own problems really so i mean i've experienced these problems for so long and that i just have internalized what is needed and i think several other of the the people on the team are, are in the same situation so that's just helpful all the time sometimes when you're building open source in the beginning it can be harder to get get like rich feedback because yeah, it's open source they don't need to ask you for anything they can just use the the product but we always have that guide of we know exactly what to build because we're we're solving it for ourselves. And you know, worst case, we fail, and then now we have like amazing, amazing tools to build another something else with. <laughs> so that that I think is just incredibly useful every day. And yeah, that that tip is hard to to like overdo. I think. Yeah, that's amazing. I absolutely love it that you're just on this mission to like never do another. <laughs> 
computer vision yeah. projects until we have this amazing tooling. Yeah, it just never again. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. Oh. Um, and where can people learn more about Rerun and about Nico? Sure. Um, I think the easiest is just our website. Uh, so that's rerun.io. Um, you can find links to our Twitter and different things like that. I'm not the most, uh, I don't have the biggest Twitter account. So maybe just, yeah, go there um, or find us on Twitter. I think it's uh, our handle is rerun.io, just in regular language. So one of those two, I think, is, is the best. Amazing. Thanks so much for joining, Nico. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks. Enjoy the chat.